bless you, Facebook and YouTube. How you doing? This is Apostle Robert Jenkins. Welcome to Divine Insight Ministries. If this is your first time, we are out of New Orleans. And as always, me and my wife like to take up the time and say thank you. We appreciate all those who support this ministry in the ways that God is leading you to do that. And we thank you for that. God bless you. As always, we ask you to do a couple things. First of all, we ask you to hit that share button. Good to see you, Sister Evie. God bless you. Brother Michael, God bless you, man. God, I see great things happening in your life, man. Just keep pushing. Keep pushing. Rwanda, God bless you. God bless you. Sister Rita, God bless you. Go ahead and hit that share button. Share this on your page. And also invite a lot of people out this month. I mean, just start with the day. Good to see you, Sister Tanya. God bless you. Go ahead and hit that share button and invite some people out. I'm telling you, this word this week will change in this whole entire month. It's going to change your life. God is pivoting us into new things in the kingdom. We're being transcend. We're being transformed. We're being converted. Uh, we're being elevated. There's a lot of things going on. God is cleaning us. We learned that yesterday. And so uh, it's just a wonderful thing of what we're doing in the body of Christ. And we're coming together as a, as a unit. We're coming together as oneness. We're building a community. And so that's what it's all about. Good to see you, Sister Hilton. Brother Michael, man, love you, man, always. Thank you for your insight. And uh, you're just a, a powerful person in the kingdom of God. God bless you, Sister Harris. God bless everybody. Go ahead, Sister Jane. Love you. God bless you. God bless you, Sister Samuel. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, everybody. So go ahead and hit that share button. Share this on your page. You know the day is the third day of our fast. Brother Brian, God, bl God bless you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sister Helen, it's the third day of the fast. Today we will end the fast at 12 noon will be the end ending of this fast. It's been a great three days. God has been talking to us. Many people have had some great visions and dreams. God reveals some things about their lives. And so it's been a cleansing. It's definitely been a cleansing. Good to see you, Evangelist Joyce Bryant. God bless you. And so long time, long time, long time, long time. Always good to see you. And so it's it's a blessing for what God is doing in our lives. And he's just cleaning this up. He's cleaning the house. Uh, he's letting us know where we are in God. It's a beautiful thing. So today we'll be ending the fast at 12 noon. And then we just keep continuing on. Now remember now, once you had a real encounter with God, whether it's through fasting, through prayer, through worship, you'll never be the same. So you'll never go back to eating mentally the way you used to eat because you'll realize something in God. When God... When you have a real encounter with God, you can't return, okay? And so that's the key. You'll never be, go back. If, if if whatever you were doing was an enemy against your walk with God, then how do you go back to the same type of walking, okay? And so we, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So let's get ready to pray. And we're going to go into, we're really going to tap into uh, a lot of things today coming out of Ephesians chapter 4, okay? So I told you this month we're going to talk about the prophetic but God is not leading me to talk about the prophetic in the in the office of a prophet in the language as keep saying the prophet. Because there's a lot of things that we need to know as Christians, as the body of Christ, before we move into the office or the gifting. Okay? And so a lot of times the problem is it's not your gifting. The problem is your character, your level of integrity. And if you would just do right as a Christian, not right as a leader, not because you're a pastor, but because you belong to God. And then a lot of things will be in order. So we'll talk about that today. Good to see you, Brother Leron, man. Miss you so much. I'm working on my music, man. I think about you all the time. I, I wish you, uh, I was, I wish we could be together in the same city, man, because I could definitely use your musical gift in so many ways, man. And I, I thank God for who you are in God. I love you so much, man. And it's just a privilege to be able to, to have you be a part of us uh, on this teaching. Okay, so let's move into prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, for another day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for keeping us last night. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your consistent, unconditional love. It's just it's just amazing how you love us and love us and love us until you develop us and develop us and develop us. And we thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is in our lives to lead us and to guide us into all truth, to be the convincing power that you are God and you are our Savior and you are the Father and you love us. So we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for wisdom that cries out. And God, we thank you that you've been teaching us how to listen to wisdom and how to apply it to our lives, not just speak it, but how to walk it. Wisdom is application. And so we thank you, Lord, for it. Lord, we thank you for covenant friendships. We thank you for real covering 
people that see us, that you, that you have opened who we are to them so that they can help us along this journey to please you. So we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We thank you for open heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you have opened our mind and you're increasing our faith. We pray every day for an increase of hunger and thirst for you. Let us love you and crave for you more than anything to be like you, to walk like you, that to, to walk in our original inheritance that we were given by the spiritual birth to become the sons of God. God, we thank you for that legal authority that we have on earth to declare that, that deity in our lives. And so we thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord. Bless us this morning. God, we decrease that you may increase in our lives. God, we thank you for your anointing. We thank you for fresh understanding, fresh revelation. And we thank you, Lord, that sometimes you chastise us because you love us to bring us to a place. And sometimes you purge us because it's rewarding time. Because we were fruitful, now you purge us to be more fruit and much fruit. So we thank you, Lord. Have your way. We assign angels to our mind, north, east, south, and west. God, guard this, this atmosphere so that the seed can grow. We come against any level of defense that tries to hinder the growth. But God, we don't have to worry for you told us that the weapons that we have are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds, casting out every thought and imagination. God, you all you also told us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. You also told us that out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. You also told us that the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. You also told us who can be against us if you are for us. You also told us that all things work together for the good. So God, we thank you for the keeping of your word that we have in our spirit. And that's why we can remain strong and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We thank you, Lord, that you told us to put on the whole armor of God. So God, we bless you and we have, have your way in our lives. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that he was able to die on the cross as a perfect sacrifice, as a perfect lamb to redeem us of the debt. Oh God, we bless your name. In Jesus' name, all things are done. Amen. God bless you. Welcome to Divine Insight Ministries. If this is your first time we're out of New Orleans. We do have many videos on YouTube. Please go to YouTube and support that ministry on YouTube so you can re-watch the videos over and over again. Also, we do have a website, not a website, but we have another site on Facebook called Divine Insight Ministries, and you can uh, become a follower of that, and that's, and that's how you'll get notifications uh, when we come on through that ministry as well, okay? So God bless you. Welcome, welcome. There's a lot of new faces that are coming on, and, and we thank you for that. Please hit the share button. When you share it on your page, you help us to evangelize and be able to minister and give a word to the people that you're connected to. One of the ways that we build this community is that when you connect us to who you're connected to, and one of the greatest ways to do that on, on social media is through you sharing this on your page. So you'll see my wife, she constantly says, share this on your page because God has given us a word, not just for the congregation, but for the nation. I am called uh, to, 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 to really be an example to the nations or be to be ambassador for the nations. God has given me that. And so when you share this on your page, you help us. And also invite people. A lot of people do watch parties. You can invite people. And when you hit that invite button and you start inviting people, it, it, it also brings people right to the ministries so they can get a chance to feel the heat, okay? And feel the fire, okay? And so let's move. I got a lot of things that I want to share with you today. And so let's read out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3 first, and then I'm going to give you some things that God has given me. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. God bless you. We love you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, start off by saying this. Paul, when he wrote this uh, particular letter to the church of Ephesus, uh, he was in prison at this time. And so you, you, he, he used a lot of words to describe where he are, and we'll talk about that as well. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, it starts out by saying, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. He literally was a prisoner at this time. And I think the, the person's name, the king that he was under was Nerod uh, at the time. But the amazing part about this is that Paul had come to a place in his life that he used every one of his natural experiences from a from a spiritual viewpoint. I always say, if you change the way you see things, the way you see things will change. If you change the way you see things, the way you see things will change. Good to see you come forth. And so even though he was a prisoner of, of, of a man's system or a man's kingdom at that time, he didn't see it as him a prisoner as uh, 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 of the man. He saw himself as a prisoner of God. One of the ways that 
you are preparing yourself or the lessons that God is teaching you are working. One of the ways that you know that God's method is working in your life is when your perception of your experience change. Many times in your life, you are not really ready for what God wants to do in your life because you're still blaming others. You're still seeing your life uh, through the experience and not through the truth of the experience. Okay, I told you before, Joseph said something, God, I feel the anointing already. Joseph said something very powerful to his brothers. Now, we know in the natural, he, he had a dream, Joseph had a dream, uh, his father gave him a coat, and because of that, it built jealousy among his brothers. This happens, this is a reality. And so his brothers put him in a, in a, in a, in a pit. And then they, they killed the animal, put blood on the coat, and then told their father, lied to their father, that Joseph had got killed by an animal. Well, none of that was true. Joseph knew that his brothers put him in the pit, okay? And because he was put in the pit, he ended up going from the pit to the prison, and from the prison to the palace. But when he gets to the palace and he has God's favor, and there's a family in the land, and he runs into his brothers, uh, his brothers are, are dealing with some guilt and shame by the way they did. They lied for years and they kept this lie. Not only did they tell this lie, they held to the lie. The father believed for years based upon what his sons had told him that his son was, was dead. And so when they finally ran into him, now the lie is being exposed. And I told you yesterday, God is cleaning the house. God is exposing things and he's doing it out of love because he has to expose things in order for some things to be uh redeemed for some things to be reconciled they have to be exposed okay and so when that happened they were dealing with guilt and shame but this is the point that i'm making joseph did not see his brothers as the enemy when they said we did you wrong he said no you didn't do me wrong that was the will of the lord now, wait a minute. What do you mean that's the will of the Lord? You mean tell me that was God's will for my own brothers to put me in the pit? God had changed his perception. God had dealt with him and revealed to him that regardless of what you go through, God really gave him a New Testament understanding from a, in an Old Testament place. This is all things working together for the good. And so many times in your life, you're not really prepared yet. You're still being in training or you're being developed because you're still upset about what happened to you. You're still blaming people. You're still uh, holding fault. You have unforgiveness. But when you see it, out of the eyes of God, you'll be able to say, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm not in here because man can hold me down. I'm in here because it must be God's will. I'm, I didn't lose something because uh, man could take something from me. I lost it because God didn't want me to have it. And so when you understand that from a godly perspective, you can put God in your experience and be able to have joy in the midst of sorrow, be able to have peace in the midst of confusion, be able to rest in a boat that's full of water because you understand God's plan for your life. And so Paul says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. God don't have you in that prison cell, but really he, he felt like and he knew that it was God's will for me to be here. And this is the key that when you're going through. Now, let me talk to you because I'm going to talk a lot today about leadership. And eventually, I'm going to get to the, the center of it, which is the, the office of a prophet or the gifting of the prophet or the prophetic. But regardless of what gifting you operate in, how you perceive things are very important. And one of the problems is we have leadership that have not died to the lessons that God is trying to teach us. And you're still blaming people. You still think it's so-and-so that made you lose the house. It's so-and-so because you lost the kids. If so-and-so wouldn't have talked so much, I would have still had my kids and things like that. You still blame me, but you've got to be able to see that regardless of where you are, whether you are in prison, whether you are free, whether you are in a pit, whether you're in a fiery furnace, whether you've been rejected, whether you've been ostracized, criticized, it don't matter. It's a plan of God. And when you see it from God's perspective, then you can be able to be the God person you're called to be in the midst of it. Prison didn't change you for writing these letters. It don't change your purpose. It don't change what you're called to do. It doesn't diminish any of the qualities that God has in your life. And quit allowing things you're going through to, to abort the message that God is trying to show you. You are not above heartaches. You're not above rejection. You're not above 
prison, but you must understand that your purpose will not stop because you have to experience some things. Life brings these things. As a matter of fact, you don't, know, you don't even know trouble until you start telling things the way God wants you to tell it. And so you, until you start doing things the way God wants you to do it, but that's okay because you can handle it because at the end of the day, I am still in the hands of the master. It don't matter what people are trying to do to me, I belong to God. And so I belong, and when you know you belong to God, you can say things, even in some physical, uncomfortable situations, you'll know how to say, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And so Paul said that. And Joseph was able to tell his brothers, don't be upset, don't be feeling guilty, don't be feeling shame for what you did. You was really being used by God to bring me to the place. I can only help you because you because you hurt me. Because of what you did to me, positioned me to be in a place to bless you. And you better realize that there's some things that you went through that you're crying about, you're upset about, you're frustrated about. These things are about to position you to be a blessing for somebody else. And when you see that it's God doing it, it's God allowing it, the devil can't even come to you unless he gets God's permission. Matter of fact, not even get God's permission, God will consider you and point you out to him so he can drive you to the place it was the devil chasing me that checked that made me run to God. I only ran to God because I was being chased by something that I couldn't handle. And so you have to realize that the all things do work together for the good who them who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose, and whom he foreknew, he predestined. God established it. He set you up for the setup so that you can be lifted up. Oh, watch this. And so you must understand this. So Paul started out by saying this. Now watch this. He said, I'm there for the prison of the Lord. And when you realize that it is God that is allowing some things, God is bringing you to some place. He ain't left you by yourself. He knows what you're going through. And when you can give him glory in the midst of it, now you're being ready for what he's about to do in your life. It's training, watch this, it's training for the ministry, okay? Very key, very key. Because, and, and I'll say this to those who operate under the uh, the prophetic, because we, that's the that's the subject we're talking about. You gotta know how to see your troubles as a blessing. You gotta know how to see your troubles as a blessing. That's everybody. Learn to see your troubles as a blessing. If you ask, if you ask the diamond, how did you become so bright? How did you become so brilliant? He'll tell you because of the pressure that was applied to me when I was a rock is the reason why I'm a diamond now. A diamond is only a rock that handled the pressure. If you ask the, the cake, how did you become so sweet? How did you become so helpful to me? I love this. He'll say because I was able to handle the pressure of the oven. You have to realize, and it's the pressure of what you're going through, that when you can change your viewpoint or allow God to bring you to a place, then you'll be able to get the message in the midst of the mess. Don't miss the, don't miss the message in the mess. Uh-oh, uh-oh, it is the message that's in the mess. Now my phone is starting to do that again, so let's, let's see what's going on. <laughs> now if it go off, I'll come right back, okay? So we're going to pray that it don't go off, okay? But it's telling me it's low. And so it's so important that we understand that. So he said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Have you come to the place yet as a leader that you know, watch this, that you are in the hands of the Lord, even when things are not comfortable, even when things are not going right, even when things seem not to be in my favor, they are in your favor because they has to work for good. At the end of the day, I don't care how it looks, because you belong to God, because God has a plan and a counsel that God's counsel was saying, you got to be able to say in the midst of all your trouble, this has to work out for the good. Because it's part of God's plan, okay? Watch this, okay, watch this. He said, I'm there for a prisoner of the Lord. He said, I beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation, wherewith you are called, okay? Worthy of your vocation. Many people want to claim they got a calling, but the question is, not the calling first. The question would be, not the calling first. The question would be, how are you walking in the call? I didn't say, how are you talking in the call? Because we got a lot of great talkers, but some slow walkers. We got a lot of great talkers, but no walkers. We got people who talking, but they're not walking. Walking means to agree. How can two walk together unless they agree? He said, look here, I'm a prisoner and I am in bonds and, I, and I'm locked down. 
but I'm still doing God's will. But I beseech you, even though my situation is not the most comfortable situation, I still want you to know something as an apostle. I still want you to know something as a man of God. You have to watch this. Walk worthy of the vocation. It's a walk. It's a walk. It's a journey of agreement with God. That's what it's all about. Now, I'm gonna, I got to say a lot of things, and I know it, it seemed like this week I, I'm giving out whoopings, but I just got to do what God tell me. The problem with people that everybody wants to be apostle, we want these titles, we want to be a prophet, we want to be a business, pastor, teacher. Everybody wants to be supernatural. People want to be the chief apostle. People want to be the bishop. But the problem is that they, they, wanna walk, they don't want to walk worthy. They want to preach. They want to justify. They, 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 they want to cover up. They want the Cadillac. They want the watches. They want the ring. They want the TBN. They want BET. They want to be on Oprah's show. But the question is, you don't want to walk worthy of your vocation. You, the problem is not your talking. The problem is not just you You want to be a celebrity. You want to be famous. You want to be rich. Come on. You want, to, you, you want attention, but you don't want to walk. Paul is dealing with the walking of it. And so many times, and I'll say this to leaders. When you have sons and daughters that, that trust in your ministry, trust in, you, in, the, in the voice of God through you, uh, they, 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 they see your anointing on your life, quit promoting people to be in the pulpit so fast. Quit giving them a right, watch this, to fall. Quit giving them a stage to fall. Because before you can get up and preach and before you can give your first sermon, I want to know how you're walking. I don't want to know how well you know Genesis to Revelation because you can be a great performer. You can be a great entertainer. But I want to know how are you walking? How are you walking in life? And so Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, that you walk worthy of your vocation or of your calling. And the worthiness, watch this. I'm going to deal with a lot of things because we are helping, we are helping people destroy people because you're putting them in position when you know their walk is not worthy of the calling yet. The walk now, I didn't say you didn't know. I didn't say you wasn't called. I didn't say that God didn't use you. I'm not saying that God didn't give you the gift. I'm saying I want to know how are you you walking. Watch this. And so what happens is, and we're not, we got to be concerned about how you're living before I know what you're saying. Because if you're not living what you're saying, then what you're saying has become a lie. Because you don't have the experience of your walk. Watch this. You, Your job is not to tell it. Your job is to show it. Even when you're studying, people, we've taught people how to study. But the real thing for study, the word study in the real Greek means, it means to make haste. And so the Bible says study to show yourself. We teaching people the study to know. And so now knowledge puffs up and now they're not able to walk worthy of the vocation because they don't have the right attitude and they walk. We have arrogant preachers. We got self-centered apostles. Watch this. We got egotistical prophets and we got people in position, but their attitude is not right. They think they're better than the person than everybody else because they know more. They think they're wiser and they think they're better. And we're not better because we've been called. We got to walk with a certain attitude. With a certain disposition about ourselves and I hate to say it but I've seen more spoiled brats in the pulpit more people who are egotistical and think they better because you know a little bit more think you beyond everybody else and half of the time you're lying because even though you can preach good you don't even love your wife the way you should need to love your wife you don't even take care of the kids the way you should take care of your own kids but you want to want to manage somebody else's life and you're not managing your own and the Bible talks about that and so Paul deals with the walking of it now, he's dealing with that even though he's in prison. It's important to him as a leader to say there is a walk that we should have as leaders. And so if you're prophetic and you're apostolic and we love to claim the title, I don't even want to know the title. I want to watch the function. I'm so tired of hearing names. Got to respect the name, but you don't respect the life. Why do you want people to respect the title when you don't respect the life? The life of a prophet, the life of an apostle, the life of of evangelist and the pastor teacher. I need to know how well can you love. Love those who lie on you, talk about you, reject you. I want to know how well can you love. I don't want to know how well you know the Bible. The devil knows the Bible. The Bible says the devil knows it and they tremble. I, yeah, the problem with it, I need to know how well you're walking. Is this working for you? Quit telling me something to love my enemies when you don't love your friends. You don't even love your members. You don't even love the people that work along with you. I need 
the walk to be where it needs to be. Uh oh, we in trouble this morning. So watch it. He said, you got to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. And then he tells us what we should look for in the walk because people love to grab the language. They'll say, well, I'm walking the walk. I've been, I'm walking this walk. I'm worthy. I don't want to hear what you say. I want to see what you say. Can I see what you say? Let me see how that looks. It's so important. Watch this. He tells us how. This is the key. He says, with well, all loneliness. Now, most of the time, that word right there has disqualified about 90% of the people who are in position. 90% of the prophets do not walk in a spirit of loneliness. They do not walk, and you can tell when they walk in the room, they think they're the richest person in the room. They think they're the wisest person in the room. They think they're the best person. They think that Jesus loved them and they're Jesus' first cousin. And the way they come in with arrogance. But Paul said, if you're going to walk, this is the attitude I should see. Before you put on the title, before you preach it all over the world, before you want somebody to, to sow into your ministry and give you thousands and thousands of dollars, I want you to know in millions now, oh, uh, before you start charging people to get your briefcase and, and, and get your armor bearers, you got a church with seven members and you got nine armor bearers. No, walk lowly. Why anybody got to carry your briefcase? Why do? Why is everybody shining your shoes? Why is everybody doing something for you? Watch this. Uh oh, you only been preaching three weeks. You can't cut your own grass. You don't drive your own car. Watch this. You don't make your own clothes. Watch this. All these type of things. That's not the spirit and the attitude. And I'm and I'm and I'm telling you, God has released me to release this word that we got to get back to a missing ingredient. The number one missing ingredient we're gonna talk about today is we're not humble. We want to preach, but we're not humble. We want to sing, but we're not humble. We want to be worshipers and leaders, but you're not humble. You don't speak to people, you're nasty, you're arrogant, we're afraid to say something, you're Dr. Jekyll, you're Mr. Hyde, one day we can get along, next day we can't, one minute you hate me, next minute you love me, this is not the ingredient that God called us to walk into, Paul tells us here, and I'm going to get to Ephesians 4 and 11, we love to quote that, and God gave gifts into the church, but before we can deal with the gift that God gave to the church, let's deal with the attitude that God required, we want to know what God has given, but we, won't, we don't want to deal with what God requires. Before you talk about how well you've been gifted, I want to know what is the requirement of your attitude. Are you allowed to be arrogant? Are you allowed to be self-centered? Are you really allowed to be a spoiled brat with power, with knowledge? No. And I'm going to answer it for you. He said, look here, I'm in prison. I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, I don't care how bad things are for me. I got to tell you the truth. The truth is, if you got to walk worthy of your vocation and which you are called, he's not denying your call. He's not denying your vocation. But he said, if you really want to walk worthy of it, you have to agree with this. This is how you do it. You got to walk with all loneliness. That word loneliness is really humility. You're not humble. This is why... The people can't tell you how bad church is. They can't tell you that they're not learning. You are so convinced by your lies that when they tell you, Pastor, that's not working, things are broken up, things are a mess, you don't want to hear it because you're not humble enough to hear the truth. You're not humble enough to face the things that are in your life. And we got too many people who are gifted but have no humility. You have no humbleness. We're afraid to talk to you. You think you're above the people. You're not above the people. Jesus Jesus walked with the people. What do you mean you can't spend time with the people? What do you mean you? I've never met so many pastors and prophets and apostles who can't walk with the people. You are above them. You can't laugh. You can't spend time. Oh, we off. We 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 can't like 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 you don't know something. Like you and your wife don't watch cussing movies at the house. Like like you don't have anything you dealing with. Your flesh been dead for years. This is not the truth. You gotta walk with all loneliness and watch this. Then he goes on and say, in meekness, he's dealing with the attitude, loneliness. When last time you met a great man of God, but he was so low and so humble. Watch this, and I'm going to break it down in a minute. And meekness, meekness is power under control. Yeah, me, I'm not, I didn't say weakness, I said meekness. Meekness is when you can do something, you don't do it. You stop yourself 
from exercising your own level of judgment. You're meek. You take the role. You take the low role. You take the abuse. You understand it. It's not time to fight. The battle is not yours. I need meekness in the house. Yeah, we got gifts in the house. We got Rolexes in the house. We got Mercedes Benz in the house. We got arrogant people in the house. We got self-centered preachers in the house. But it's, when the last time you walked in the house and said, I feel the spirit of meekness in this house. The, the leadership should should reflect the the, uh, the spirit of the house. And you walk into these houses, you don't you don't uh, feel the spirit of love or the spirit of meekness because it's not in leadership. Oh, a wise woman build a house. You want to know how well the house would go walk into the house and that woman sets the temperature for the house. She sets the temperature for the house. And same thing in the house of God, the leadership sets the temperature. And so when you see people that are not, that are not humble in the house because the leader is not humble. When you see people who don't have meekness in the house because the leader is not meek. Oh, come on. Because the Bible says like, 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 like priests, like people, like priests, like people. You quit beating up the people. And this is another thing. Prophets want to come to the house. You hire prophets. Come on. You call it a revival, but it's not a revival. You called your boy up. You made an agreement for him. You want him to come over. You're having problems in your church. And so what you do is you hire your boy to come over in the name of a revival, in the name of a convention to beat up the people, but you never have him deal with you. When the last time a prophet came to the house of God and dealt with leadership, how you gonna get mad at the toe for kicking somebody when the head told it to kick it? If the body is out of order, then the head is out of order because the body can't do anything without the direction of the head. But everybody wants to promise out to the body. And the real reason why we got these false prophets coming up dealing with the body because that's how you keep your money rolling. I come to you this year and I get 5000 from you and I'll invite you to my anniversary and I'll give you back two or three thousand and we make a deal we convince the people to give but all me and you doing is exchanging uh oh uh oh it's, it, there's, some, there's some major exposure returns can you hear me I do want to say this. If you send me messages sometimes doing the teaching, it knocks my phone out. Can you hear me, baby? In my back? I'm asking you. Asking. Okay. Can you hear me, though? Somebody say, yes, I can hear you. I'm not going to lose my thought. I'm just waiting on it. Okay, good. Thank you, Sister Pam. Thank you, cousin. And so and so, what happens is they hire their boys. And, they, and this is what happened. The boys come in, so-called apostles, so-called prophets. I got to deal with it this month. We're going to deal with the truth because we got to recover. We got to get it back. They're not humble. And so what they walk in and they beat up everybody in the church. They talk about everything that's going on, but they never deal with he headship. Listen, if a house of God is out of order, listen, if my house is out of order, you have a right to check me. I'm supposed to be the priest in this house. If things are out of order, then we got to start with the man. Okay? So if things are out of order in the church, we got to start with leadership. And half of the problem is because the leadership is not walking in the spirit of meekness, nor the spirit of lowliness. And that's why it's going on. Okay? He said you got to, with all lowliness, that's what make you worthy. Not because you can convince people or you can manipulate people or you can bribe people. But the key to it is not how well you preach. The key to it is how well can you stay humble? Can people tell you, you that you are the best preacher in the world and it don't give you a big head? Can you get blessed by God and not become arrogant because you have become blessed? Has the blessings of God changed you? Are you not the same apostle, the prophet you were when you first started? Why have you changed in the negative? Because you couldn't handle the applause. See? Real talk, can you handle what's coming along with this? With all loneliness, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, and I'm giving you by experience and by wisdom and by the Holy Ghost, you cannot handle the glory that comes from preaching. Everybody wants to be apostle, everybody wants to be the chief, and this is the new thing now. I've never met so many people that's, a, a, that's apostles and prophets. Very, most of the time you only see pastors and evangelists every now and then, but almost every person who's pastoring the church is no longer pastoring from the gifting of a pastor. When are we going to see pastors in pastors' positions? Because now it's always apostles in pastors' positions, always prophets. I'm not saying that God didn't call them to that. I'm saying everybody's not called. Some people are jumping in because you know what? We 
We think the apostles is the elevated gift. We think the apostle is the highest one. So I got to be the chief. I was the chief in the world. I was the most valuable player on the football team. Uh, all the girls like me in school. So I'm not coming to church and being no sheep. I'm a I'm an apostle. And we met, we got self-made man, apostles, self-made man, a uh, prophets, self-made man, whatever. And now we got so many titles, it's just messing me up. We are the chief bishop. Apostolic, Pentecostal, man of God, apostle. Like, where's these titles come from? There is no loneliness. There is no meekness. There is no commitment. There is no real loving the sheep. But we take that money. Uh oh, we take that money. We gonna get that money. We ain't got to be leading nobody. Nobody has grown in five years. Everybody left the church. Had to leave the church from a split. Nobody was ever released from the church. You got to leave the church. Why we got to leave the church? Why we can't be released? I didn't have to. I didn't have to quit school to graduate. No, no. I was able to finish the course. But you know why I couldn't finish the course in the church? Cause you don't have a course. You want me to be in Sunday school for the rest of my life. You're not trained to me to have on job experience the whole purpose of education is to release you into your occupation that's why it says worthy of your vocation how can I be worthy of the vocation when I'm not allowed to operate in my vocation my job is to praise him for the rest of my life give him money pay this building off and never become who I'm called to become and that's the devil and lies and, and Satan and all this satanic force to come along with it okay Paul said we're going to walk worthy of the vocation with all loneliness, meekness, watch this, with long suffering, forbearing one another. I've never seen so many people get put out in the church. We don't want to forbear nothing. We don't want to go through nothing. What kind of mother keep putting their kids out, keep putting people out? No, you don't do this. And we are known for abandoning people. You will call them sheep. You say they don't know nothing. But the minute they don't agree with us in leadership, watch this. Now you want to get rid of them. And you and you get rid of them. You say, well, I ain't never got rid of nobody. Yes, you have. You got ministers who ain't preaching your church in five years. Can't nobody preach but you. And when they do preach, you tell them what they preach. Tell them what they better say. Or you have convinced them so much that you, your way of preaching is the only way that you have raised up clones. I've never seen God, oh, we in trouble today. I've never seen so many ministers. When I close my eyes, I think I'm listening to the pastor. You talk like him, walk like him, respond like him, got the same word. That's not who you are. You have your own set of fingerprints. Your job is never to be a copy. You were born an original. You are not to imitate nobody. I don't care how good T.D. Jakes is. He can never be Robert Jenkins. I am the original Robert James Duvall Jenkins, and there can never be another me, and I ain't going to look at nobody else. I ain't going to kill me trying to be you. Oh, we're committing suicide in church because we don't have the right attitude because the so much flesh is on parade, you got people attracted to your flesh. If you want to be attracted to the man of God, let's be attracted to how humble he is, how giving he is, how loving he is, how meek he is, how he forbear one another, have long suffered. My grandmother was special because she can suffer long with you. I want, that's the quality. We're missing that. We're missing, where is the quality that he'll love you and love you and love you and love you and love you. He'll spend time, he'll empower you. He's so humble. I don't care how well God used him. I don't care how he traveled all over the world. But when he came back home, it was the same pastor that left. We 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 elevate pastors out of pastorship because when they come back, they don't have the same mindset. Now, all of a sudden, because you are preaching, because your Facebook of friends have elevated themselves, you are a different person, pastor. What happened to that humble person What was sit in the kitchen for hours and give me the word? What happened to that man and woman of God who were laid? with me, would cry with me. I can call in the midnight hour. Oh, I gotta wait for Sunday morning. I gotta wait. I gotta meet him at a distance. We don't even shake hands with people anymore because we've lost the ingredient of leadership. He says, walk with it. Worthy. You want to be worthy of it? I don't want, you know, I know my hermeneutics. Do you know humility? You got the H right. We want to know hermeneutics. We want to know all of that. I want to exegete the scripture. Exegete this. A loneliness, meekness, long suffering, love, gentleness, integrity. That, these are the things that should be the attractive force of the leadership position. Uh oh, we in trouble today. Watch this. Okay. Now, I want to stop right there because I got to bring up the points. Here we go. 
That's verses 1 through 3. If you're just coming on, hit that share button. That was Ephesians chapter 4. Don't get mad at me. It's in the Word. <laughs> Watch this. Okay, point number one. And point number one, in order to walk in the place that God has called you, whether you have the gifting of the prophet, the apostle, the pastor, and teacher, I'm dealing with you as a saint right now because we got to get it right as a saint. You're trying to get it right and you want to get your title right, but you don't want to get your life right. You want to get your title right, but your character messed up. Let's deal with this. Point number one for today, you got to be honest about where you are. You got to be honest about where you are. Did you hear that? You must be honest about where you are. I don't want to know how well you can exe exegete the scripture. I don't want to know if you know hermeneutics. I ain't trying to get you to pull out the Greek concordance and you know Greek and Hebrew. I want to know, are you honest about where you are? Where are you? I know you've been called, but where are you, Adam? I know you got an anointing on your life, but I want to know where are you? Can you be honest that I have a call, but I'm self-centered? Uh-oh, I have a call, but I'm selfish. If Listen, if you don't deal with where you are, there's some qualities that in the gifting you will, that will cause a, a misfall, will cause you to delay a lot of things because you was not honest. You got to be honest about where you are. The whole thing that Peter had to go through because Jesus was trying to bring him to an honest place. You are called, Peter, without a doubt. you the one that said thou art the Christ. But Peter, you're arrogant and you don't. You got to deal with your arrogant. And matter of fact, Peter, you're not arrogant. Simon is arrogant. The natural side of you, the spiritual side of you have a calling. Listen, do you know you can have a calling, but you still just as self-centered as you want to be? Do you know just because just because you call don't mean that the self-centeredness don't have to be dealt with, the selfishness don't have to be dealt with? Come on, somebody. You got to deal with where you are. You got to be honest and say, Lord, I know you called me, but did you forget that I'm that I'm prideful? Did you know that I, I'm a thief and I will manipulate people? God, you got to be honest. Listen, listen, listen. You got to be honest with you and God. God, and then you got to be honest with yourself. You got to be honest because listen, in order to really walk this thing out that you're called to be, this is the problem with leadership right now. You don't deal with you. Why everybody else coming to the altar, but you never get a breakthrough. When you, there's some things in your life that got to change. Jacob, you are the one. 12 sons are going to come out of you, but Jacob, you are a con artist. You were still a birthright. You were still a blessed man of God. And we got Jacobs that has not been changed in Israel. They want to preach as Jacob, but you are a con artist. You will manipulate the people you know what to say, you know when to say it, you know how to look, you know how to jump, you know how to speak in tongues, you know how to shout, but you don't deal with you. You deal with everything you have to deal with to make the church grow, to get more money, to get more members, but you don't deal with it to get more love, to get more character, to get more integrity. So you got to be honest with yourself. Every day I tell God you got to break me. And listen, and I've been through so many things in my life. It wasn't that God was against me. It was God saying, I need to work on you. Do you know that if I don't work on you, David, and I know David, you killed Goliath. I know that people are saying Saul killed a thousand and David killed 10,000. But that same man, watch this, that same man that killed Goliath, that same man who wrote Psalms 23, is that same man who called up another man's wife, Bathsheba, had her come upstairs. Come on, somebody. Watch this. Watch this. H -h had her come upstairs, slept with her. Come on. Uh-oh. Her husband was a part of his army, was committed to him. She, he used him in battle to fight his battles by he having sex with his wife. This is what the problem is. You're not meek enough, David. You, matter of fact, you so arrogant, you so prideful now, David, that it's, you are a man of war and you're not even going to war. You are above war now. You, are, you don't even go to Bible study. You, you, don't even, you don't even show up for the prayer meeting. Oh, you, you're not even part of the altar call anymore. Because you made it. You at a certain level. You are the chief apostle. You are the, the you are the nation's prophet. But you about to fall. Why? Because you're not dealing with some things with you. And not only did you call another man's wife up. And this is the problem. This is why we got so much infidelity in the pulpit. This is why we got so many infidelity. I've never seen so many cheating leaders in my life. I've never seen so many self-centered. Well, take your wife. Well, take, take your husband. You got women do the same thing. Come on. Come to town. This stuff that's going on with Prophet Juanita Bound, that ain't nothing new. That's been going on for years. And she ain't the only one. There's a whole 
lot of them. Come on, somebody. When we play games, they're not they they arrogant, they nasty. Uh, it is it is it's sad when you got the world testifying against the saint. You got the the person at the hotel saying that she's nasty. She's been here many times. It's terrible because there's no spirit. You're not walking worthy. And listen, but we love the whole old. She ain't taking off that title. Listen, there's some things in your life that you should say. I'm not calling myself that anymore until I work on some stuff. You know what? I need to be broken. You know what? Call me Robert Jenkins. Because you know what? I need to be worked on. Robert Jenkins needs work on. Come on. You really know when you really want to do it right. When you remove the title while God working on you. Uh, it don't change who you are. It don't change your gifting. It says you're honest about where you are. See? See, everybody, will, when I put that title up, I'm going to talk about the prophetic. People wanted me to prophesy. We're going to get a word. I'm going to learn how to move. Learn how to work on you. Be honest. Can you tell the truth about yourself? About yourself. Where are you in the text? Quit seeing everybody else in the text. Because when you read about Peter, you're probably reading about yourself. When you read about David, there's a whole lot of preachers that have slept with people's wives. Uh-oh. Yeah, whole lot of people that had people husbands killed. David literally had her husband killed. But there are a lot of ministers that are killing you, castrated the husband by what you did with the wife. The spiritual death that is going on. And then you got people that is with you in the ministry that knows this kind of stuff is going on in the church. But they keep in quiet too so they can keep their position. We got secret societies right in the church. The Illuminati is right in the pulpit. Come on, somebody. We don't like this kind of talk. Real talk. Watch this. Goes on because it was David, family member, that carried the letter. He knew what that letter said. He agreed with leadership. You got people that are agreeing with leadership to kill other people to protect the position. Uh-oh, we have people who lack the integrity that it's not about keeping your name clean, pastor. It's about keeping the life of Christ clean. You making life looks bad because you're supposed to represent Jesus, not your name. It's not about your name. It's about his name. It don't look good to call yourself a pastor when you're sleeping with the sheep. Incest going on. Come on, somebody. You know it. And we got to deal with it. So you can't deal with it until you're honest. I had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest. You got a lot of people that you're broken. You was broken when you, when you received the call. You ran with the call, but you didn't say, God, I need you to work on my life. I need you to work on me. I need you to work on me. When, when the Bible says in Isaiah, the, 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 the day or the year that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, a man woe is me of unclean lips. When you have a real upward look, you're going to have an inward change. A real, when he said, a man, hi, I, I see the train fill the temple. But he said, I'm a, a man of unclean lips. When last time you heard your pastor say, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. My attitude is not right. I don't walk in meekness. Oh, I'm not forgiving. I hold grudges. I sit people down and never tell them that they've been sat down. Oh, I got to be honest with myself. I'm greedy. When I see people come in, I will get the money. I know how to read people, but I read them so I can know what to do with them. I'm a controlling person. I have a controlling attitude. I have a I have an addiction to power. I love power. So the more people praise me, the more I get in my flesh. Ooh, we got to deal with it. We got to deal with it. See, you got to be honest about yourself. You got to be honest. God forced David to be honest. God had to force Peter. Peter said, Lord, I'll go wherever you go. He said, no, you won't. The devil desired to sift thee as wheat. And Peter is not the only person in leadership that the devil desired to sift thee as wheat. The devil want a one night stand with you to mess up your whole entire ministry. But you got to be honest with yourself. He, Peter was not honest. I'll follow you wherever. He said, you won't follow me. And you're going to deny me three times. It don't mean you're not called. I'm going to use you. But you got to be converted. We got apostles that need to be converted. Prophets that need to be converted. We want to, you want to hold on to your title. And you're hiding. You have a fig leaf title. The title was not designed to be a fig leaf. It was not to hide your nakedness because you went against God. You can't make your own covering. You can't choose your own position. You got man-made Apostles, prophets, man. you put yourself in that position because you never let God work on you. God has to work on you. See? Real talk. So you got to be honest about where you are. That's point number one.
Give me some time. We're going to take time today. Watch this. Point number two. You got to be honest about what you don't know. One of the major reasons why we're not, we don't, we don't walk in the spirit of humility because we think we know it all. One of the most dangerous things we've ever learned as people is knowledge. Because, and we need knowledge, but knowledge was post, the purpose of knowledge was post so that you would know how to show yourself to God. You don't, you don't go to Bible college so you can make them feel dumb. I've never been around so many leaders who wants to embarrass the people. You know you just learned that word last week. Getting up in pulpit saying all these, and the ecumenical, that's not how you talk, Doc. <laughs> look here, look here, Doc. My name is not Doc. Your name is not Doc. Why, why all of a sudden, when we walked into the church, we were just in the car cussing. We get to church, all of a sudden, now we got a new language. This is the game that's going on. No, no, no. You got you, you, you become puffed up because you didn't learn a couple classes. Somebody taught you something. You, you learn stuff. There are people right now. You are on Facebook. You listen to me because you've able to. You was able to hear the revelation. And the only reason why you want this revelation, you don't want this revelation to live right. You don't want this revelation to change. You want this revelation to impress. You can't wait to post something up. You can't wait to tell somebody what you heard me say and you want them to think it came from you. You don't have the light for the words. You don't have the oil for the words. You don't have the experience for the word. You have never been beat by the very thing I say. You was never molested. None of those things. But you want to have what came out of them so that you can look good. This is egotistical attitude. Ooh. You got to deal with it. Your whole purpose of knowledge, and you have you have never noticed that the more you know, the less you praise God. The more you know, your knowledge has knocked you out of being a worshiper. When you was ignorant, you cried. When you didn't know nothing, you went after God. When you didn't know nothing, you had a whole good thirst. The more you learn, the less the the less you worship, and the more you criticize. You can tell us more wrong with church than you can tell us right with God now because you have knowledge. You have used your gift of discernment. To justify why you're not committed. And now, so now you use your gift to bring out every fault in everyone else and never deal with yourself. Woo! Oh, we don't like this kind of preaching here. You got to be honest about what you don't know. And let me tell you something. Half of the stuff we think we know, you don't know. Every day, I try to spend some time studying. And I do a lot of studying, a lot of reading. And do you know every time I do that, I find out what I don't know? Now, I'm going to help you if you know you're not humble. This is how, because I'm going to show you something. God, I was arrogant at one time and didn't know I was arrogant. And my knowledge had made me arrogant. And what happens in my arrogancy, I'm going to tell you how I wasn't, I wasn't walking with loneliness. Because I, be, I, I, was, I, I had begun to be attractive or be attracted to people who had great revelation. And in that, I wanted that without the process. I wanted the end result without the process. And so I begin to say things that they would say. The problem with that, that is that I wasn't sensitive to the heart of the people. When you only have knowledge without the heart, you judge people wrongly. You kill them unfairly because you don't have a heart for them. So I would say things that sound good, but was not sensitive. And I remember being at a church in Charlotte and a lady said to me, you're very arrogant. And I didn't believe I was arrogant, see? I didn't believe it. I said, no, not me, because I've been through so much in life. I never thought that that quality was on my life. Well, one of the reasons why I was arrogant is because I was using somebody else's words from their arrogance. The people that I was listening to, they were arrogant. Did you hear that? So a lot of times when you want to be a prophet, the problem is the prophet that you admire, he's self-centered, he don't love his wife, and you have his, and, and, and you didn't talk on his spirit because he didn't told you. That's another thing. You better have my spirit if you're in my leadership. You better get rid of, you better get rid of those spirits. If you don't have, if you have any other spirit but the spirit of Christ, you are anti-Christ. Come on. And so you take on that arrogancy. And so I was taking on the arrogancy of people's words that I admire. They had revelation, but the arrogant. I'm telling you, I've been in the music industry all my life. I've never met so many people that when they sing, you feel they're anointing. But when you talk to them, they're arrogant. I've never seen the mixture, but it's true. It's because we do not deal with 
walking worthy again because gifts comes without repentance, but kingdom comes with it. And they're not kingdom minded, they're gifty minded. Woo! Watch this. And so this young lady told me that. And I couldn't see it. But I thank God for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was wrestling with me because somebody can tell you some truth about yourself. And even though you reject it, you fighting it, you screaming and you proving they're wrong, there's a little voice saying, uh, I, they're right. And so I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure it out until I just began to pray with it. And God says, yeah, you arrogant. And then he showed me. I was up preaching, right? This is the thing I used to say. I got it from my angle name the preacher, but he's a very arrogant preacher. Got a lot of good stuff, but he's arrogant. So that's another thing. I've never seen... And I'm telling you this for myself on down. We are gifted. We're powerful. But we're not humble. We're not humble. You're known by your knowledge, not by your humility. That's wrong. You should be known by your humility. Jesus was a humble man. Jesus spoke with authority without raising his voice. He didn't have to prove. We got flesh on parade. And we're attracted to flesh. We're attracted to glitter. We're no different than the world. We like to go. <laughs> Come on. So I was preaching, right? And so there was this thing that I used to say that I got from this arrogant preacher. I have, first of all, stop getting stuff from people and get on your face. You want to learn from this man, that man. You want to learn from this prophet. It's good to read books. But why do you read five books when you don't pray? Why are you studying when you don't fast? You don't spend time with God, but you want information from people who had the labor on their face to get that. Woo! Watch this. So I, so I was arrogant, didn't know it. God sent somebody to show me, right? So I'm preaching, and I used to say this, and I stopped saying it because it's not what it's not the heart of God. Okay, I used to say this. You better get right before you get left. It was catchy. I liked it. Ooh. You better get right before you get left. There you go. See? Sounds good. You better get right before you get left. All those things God was like, so you don't care if they get left, huh? See? You want to tell them something. Won't you show them what it is to get right? How, what do getting right look like? But you want to say it and people, and guess what? You got people in the audience that will approve your arrogantness. Because there's somebody on the right side of the church who think they're better than the person on the left side of the church. And so a lot of times when we're preaching, we ain't doing them but throwing darts. We know who we're talking about. We're talking about Sister Brown over there with the big hat on that we don't like. And so you better get right before you get left because we've already judged Sister Brown. We've already decided that Sister Brown is not right. And so what happens is you got cheerleaders in the congregation that's with you, Pastor. And so when you say, you better get right before you get left, amen, and you look over at the person. Amen. In other words, boom. Sister Brown, that was for you. That's what we do. That's wrong. That's not, that's not walking worthy of your, your vocation. No. You, 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 you've taken the knowledge of God and you use it to kill. You use it to kill. Oh, you got to be honest about what you don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to do this in a broken heart. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And, and so this, this is the test. This is another thing. Now we deal it now. Stay with me. Watch this. How do you know if you're not working with him in the spirit of humility? Here it is. I'm going to ask you a question. I do this all the time. God has me. And God teaching me. Watch this. I'm going to ask you a question. I know you don't know. You know you don't know. God know you don't know. I'm going to show you how the spirit of humility, we fight against it. I'll say to you, uh, have you ever heard of the spirit of of justification and sanctification being married. Now, I'm making up something crazy, right? Here we go. Yeah, yeah, there's a new doctrine I'll call the sanctification and, 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 and justification being married to one another. Have you ever heard of that theory? This is when you know you don't have the spirit of humility. I ain't never heard of that theory. I just made that up just now. But there are some people that I would say that to, they would say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, the theory the theory of, and, and they, what they're trying to do is figure it out in their mind. Why can't you just say you don't know? Why you always got to have an answer? Why you always got to have the answer? Why can't you say, I don't know? I ain't never heard of that. See, we have leaders that I don't care what you say to them, they know. I don't care what you're going through to have the answer for. Why you always have the answer? I do not have the answer. I probably say, I don't know at least 10 times every day. I don't know. I mean, it's simple stuff. My wife can ask me, where's those socks I gave you last week? Baby, I don't know. 
Those socks I gave you in the bag. I don't, I don't know, baby. The socks I gave you in the bag last week. I don't know. Because I don't know. Now, pride, watch this. I say, yeah, the socks, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get them. They know you don't know where they at. Because you don't want your wife to know you don't know. Uh-oh. Can you handle being a leader and there's a question and you know you're the leader, but you don't know? If you can't admit what you don't know, then you will lead blindly and deceive the people that you know. When you can't handle can you even handle, can your pride handle, can your pride handle not knowing? Can you handle being in the midst of people who smarter than you and you don't lose who you are? Can you be strong at the place you're at? Can you be comfortable that you are in the third grade and you're talking to people in the sixth grade? Why do you have to always have the answer? That's what makes you lie. That's what makes you pretend because you don't know. You're not fair. You got to be honest. I don't know how to live right. Tell the truth. You don't know how to commit to God. You don't know how to be honest. See? And I'm listening. To, I'm watching some of, the, some of the things that's coming up now. And I'm hearing some of the comments. But some of the comments is not from the spirit of meekness. I even watch how people respond to what I say. Because we want to always be on top. We got to always have a Bible verse. If the man of God says God is good, we're going to answer all the time. If he says the Lord is my shepherd, we're going to swear he's a 23rd soul. I shall not want. I'm not at that verse. Why can't you learn? Why can't you be meek? I'm telling you, it's a trick that you have to always feel like you're on top. You have the answers. You are in alignment. You know what to say. I can preach. You're not humble. And when you're not humble, the truth of the matter is a lot of times people just want to preach from the pulpit. I mean, from the congregation. You want to teach from the back seat. I've watched many times and I'm telling you, I'm telling you God is cleaning house. Listen, there's a lot of comments that come across even on this ministry. I don't need you to comment on everything. Uh-oh, we don't like this. Why? Because you need to be led by God. Can you learn? Can somebody say something and you know what they say? saying? You know the answer, but why you have to always say? Why you have to let us know that you know? You're not walking worthy. Learn to be meek. Can you be taught something that you know and you listen as if you don't? But you always got to respond. And that don't mean that you should not respond. That means you got to know how to be led out of the spirit of meekness. Meekness will teach you how to be quiet. Te meekness will teach you that I'm going to speak what God tell me. Because you, preacher, I'm going to trust God to give it to him. But we want to help God. See, that's arrogance. Prophet, apostle, versus pastor, teacher. Okay, let me get into it. I, my time is already up and I'm only at point number two. You got to be honest about where you are. You got to be honest about what you don't know. And a lot of times your motive is self-centered. She wouldn't tell us is the level. Of, I was trying to read your post, Gil. I'll come back to it tomorrow and I'll read it. There's different levels of ignorance. Yeah. True intelligence is the recognition of my... True intelligence is the recognition of the level of ignorance. ignorance. Okay. That which I don't. That which I don't know. Real talk. Okay, watch this. Point number three. How long can you listen to truth before you run and tell it? See? If I want to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, how well... Can you listen to truth? Because this is what we do. This is what I'm going to tell you when you don't have the right spirit. And I'm not telling you you're not called. Don't take this. Each, trying to say people. I'm not saying you're not called. I'm saying that you're not walking worthy of the vocation because the spirit of meekness. And it's on all of us. I got to fight it. You're no different than me. If you're called to be in leadership, arrogant, self-centered, knowledge will puff up. Knowledge will puff up. Knowledge will puff you up. Your job is to humble yourself. God don't say, I'm going to humble you. He said, humble yourself. It's better for you to humble yourself than God to humble you. Humility. Watch this. How long can you listen to truth? This is another thing leaders are doing. As soon as they get the answer, they run. You, I, I can barely get it out of my mouth. Why can't you sit there and listen to it? What is it about you? Do you know pride won't let you take your whooping? Pride says, 
You ever notice people who, who struggle with pride? And really, pride is a sign of insecurity. But there are people who struggle with this, and you know this because they can't handle it. So they do something wrong. You'll find this a lot in kids. I look at kids when they be a chastiser. I look at how well they handle the chastisement. A kid do something wrong, you call him in the room, and you say, I told you not to eat that cookie. As soon as you told him, I told you not to touch them cookies. As soon as you say that, here's what they say. Okay, mom, I got it. How you got it? I just said it. What you said is that I'm not going to let you purge me through this truth. I can't sit here. Now, this is what preachers do. I'm talking to preachers now. Apostles and prophets, various pastor, teacher. This is what we do. You was living wrong Monday through Thursday. You learned that it's wrong by Friday. By Saturday, you're doing a whole conference on it. You just was living terrible for five days, the very sin. But the minute you get a revelation, you don't let that whoop you and purge you and sanctify you and get it all out of you. You want to teach the people how to do something that you just start doing and you only start doing it so you can teach it. Quit learning things so you can teach, so you can hide your weakness behind your knowledge. Can you sit and let God tell you the truth and you sit there and let it purge you? You ain't so quick to tell it. I've never seen so many people that call themselves apostles, prophets, and messengers, pastors, but you don't take your whooping. You don't get purged. And I'm not saying because I want you to be whooped. I'm saying that if you deal with it, if you don't let God purge us all out of you, that's why Jesus came back and said, Peter, do you love me? Three times because he denied him three times. I got to purge that out of you because if you don't get that right, you're not going to feed the sheep right. You're not going to love them right. And see, this is wrong with our kids. We know why we got arrogant kids. It's not that you didn't whoop them. It's that you let them move too quick out of the whooping. You broke the, 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 you broke the punishment too early. And so the arrogance of their sin was not broken because you said you want punishment all week. That punishment lasts two hours. Two hours after they broke everything in your house. Two hours after they lied. Two hours after they did something. They back in the pool. They back at the movies. They back going on. And we do that same thing in God. Ooh. And there is no breaking on the inside of who they are. Because they're so quick. And so I've, I've met men and women of God. that even in ministry with me. But the minute that they get corrected, I'm going to teach that tomorrow. How are you going to teach that tomorrow when you were just guilty of it an hour ago? You need that to process in you, to break in you. Not just the knowledge, but we teach information. We need to be teaching what we live in and what we have lived and what we have processed, what we have labored. Because the oil is on the breaking. You didn't get broke by the truth. You ran with the truth. But it didn't break you. That's why there's no change. And so you teach something you cannot live. You teach something you have not lived. Woo! How long can you listen to the truth before you run and tell it? Quit being so quick to preach it. You just got it. Let's see if it works for you. Quit telling people something that have not have a, have a history of working for you. Because there's more in the lesson. What you need to be able to preach in the lesson has to come out of, watch this. That's why, David, watch this. David didn't repent. People say, well, David had a repentant heart. No, David got caught by the prophet. David had sex with that, lady, with that man's wife. He called her up. He used his authority. That's another thing. We be in position. You know that people, there are people, God, we are here today. There are women that they'll sleep with you because you're in the pulpit. They love to sleep with power. You better believe every one of them thank yous is not thank you. Every one of them hallelujahs in church is not hallelujah. Sometimes when the women is hollering hallelujah, they really say, Pastor, you can call me tonight. Hallelujah. Pastor, I'll take my clothes off for you. Thank you. Pastor, I'll give you my money. Hey, glory. They're not saying that. They're making themselves available. See, we don't like this kind of real talk, real talk, real talk. There's no real change. See, and what happens is it helps you stay arrogant as a leader because you can do these things with Bathsheba. Watch this. Because you're the king, because you're the pastor, because you're the bishop, because you're the apostle. Yeah, David. And guess what David did? He just married his sin. 
He married her, went on about his business like he never had that woman's husband killed. How many husbands are not in church because you as the leader, you killed them by the way you treat their wife? What you did sexually, mentally, spiritually with that woman, you spiritually seduced her. You use your power and authority to seduce her. And now her husband is dead to her. She has no respect for his authority, no respect for his position, because you killed her husband by your intimacy with your power with her, with your position with her. And she bowed to it. And so even though he's not dead physically, he's dead spiritually. He's dead emotionally. And he was loyal to you and you killed him. Woo! You still want to be apostle? Still want to be a prophet? You have to have loneliness. I'm telling you, the power. there was one time in my life I had stopped preaching. I was afraid of the power that I had. When I realized how powerful my gift was, when I realized that I could say something and people will believe me and follow me, I could take you to hell because I have a gift. A gift is a dangerous thing. Because you can convince people that it's blue and everybody will believe it's blue. And then tomorrow you can say, nope, that's wrong, it's red. And everybody will be, say it's red. It's called the Wizard of Oz. You will become the Oz. You're hiding behind a title and everybody dancing to what you say. And you will lead people in the wrong way. And I, when I realized that, I got afraid of that power. I remember my, my, my cousin telling me, she, and they called me Vail. You should know that by now. And she said, Vail, you got to be careful. I said, why? She said, because you're so convincing. You know so much. You can tell people something and they'll believe you. And the more you can change it and they'll believe you. And I got afraid of that power. One of the problems is that we got people who want to be apostles or called to be apostles and prophets, but you're not afraid of the power that it has. You ought to be afraid that when you say something, people will believe it. They won't even check with God. Your power is so great as a leader, you can tell somebody that's the Greek word and they will not look it up. You, they can tell you something and you will not check for yourself. One of the reasons why leadership is falling so much because there's no accountability from the congregation. You don't study to know if your pastor is right or wrong. And so this is the new thing. He can tell you, don't listen to me. Don't let that say, don't listen to me, check with God. Well, they're already so convinced by you that they're not going to check with God. They believe what you're saying is God, and that's not God. Because they're not going to check. They don't know what is God because they're not going to check. They're going to do, that's what slaves do. Slaves don't think half of the time in church, we're not leaders of people, we're leaders of slaves. You have already enslaved their mind. You've already indoctrinated them. You, we are, slaves was afraid to think. They can work, but they couldn't think. You know they're not going to check. You know they don't have the discipline to check. So you can say that all day long. They don't, you, you're not fooling nobody because you say, well, make sure you try the spirit by the spirit. They don't know what spirit is the spirit to try it by the spirit. And you know that. You've never taught them how to try the spirit. You never taught them how to detect a wolf in sheep clothing. So you tell them about a wolf in sheep clothing could be the wolf in sheep clothing. Because you don't teach them. Woo! Okay? Real talk. Real talk, real talk. So David, David was arrogant. And the prophet, I think, married him. He going on about his kingship. The husband dead. He didn't marry the wife. She pregnant. Then the prophet, and the prophet put it in a riddle. And, that, and, and, and this is how arrogant David was. David was so arrogant that when the prophet put it in a riddle about him, David said, this man should die. This man is guilty. And then the prophet said, and that man is you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Your arrogance know how to judge a situation, but you don't know how to judge it when it comes to you. You said this man should die. It is you. Half of the stuff that we know about situations is what we are guilty of ourselves. I got to get off of here. How long do you listen to truth before you run and tell it? Point number three. Point number four, and I'm going to stop here. The number one misingredient is the mind of Christ. We got all month to teach on this. The number one misingredient is the mind of Christ. We got people who are, who are called, but they're, not, they're not, not walking worthy of their calling. 
before I can get to what a, what a prophet is and what a prophet should do, let me see what you do as a saint. How do you deal with knowledge? How do you deal with people? Are you humble? Are you humble? Are you humble enough that you can admit when you're wrong? Are you humble enough to be taught? How are you going to be led by the Spirit when you don't listen to the Spirit? Can you listen? Do you have to be the smartest? Do you have to always know? Do you have to be seen? Have you ever dealt with the broken parts in your life? If you got, if you got a calling, you got problems. Have you been honest about you? Are you always chevelling for yourself? The omelet is no better than the egg. Are you working on the egg? Or you, or you, or, or you, or, or, or do you just want to be used? You don't, you don't care if you end up in hell. And even though you may say you do, the, 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 the lack of working on yourself says that you don't care. You can't really care about hell because you're not working on you. See, this is what we need. We got too many people that you want to be laid. You, I want somebody to lay hands on me and ordain me. Oh, can, can, you, can you ordain me? Ordain you? Are you even honest about your call? The first call is to come, not to go. Why are you so quick to want to preach, but you don't want to pray? You, you, when you pray, you can't even get a breakthrough. You, you, you want me to teach you how to set up a sermon. But you can't even pray with passion. You're not even honest in your prayer. You still praying like your last pastor. You saying what somebody told you. You can't even talk to God from where you are really experiencing. You still not honest about your own brokenness. But you want to be behind the pulpit. And you feel like we wrong. Pastors is wrong because they don't use nobody. And they should start using people. But you got to train them first. I got to know where your attitude is. Now, I, I, pastor, pastor, I know my Greek. Yeah. Do you know how to be humble? Can you sit and wait and not be jealous while you're sitting? Can you really be fathered? Have you ever really been fathered? Can you be? See, this is another thing. We're messing people's lives up. You know why? We're putting children in the pulpit. Children in the pulpit. And they've never been fathered. So now you got a spoiled brat as the apostle. So he go get that money. I'm spoiled brat. I'm going to have the best shoes. I'm going to have the best clothes. I'm going to have the best things because I'm spoiled with a calling. And I'm not ever denying the calling. I'm saying to be worthy of the calling, of the vocation in which you have been called. The first thing I need you to look at is how humble are you? Humility. I got to ask some questions. Real humility can say, woe is me, a man has unclean lips. Real humility can say, I need God to work on me. When I first met my wife, one of the things she said to me, she said, you got to catch up. It's the truth. You got to catch up. I don't care how much Bible I've been studying. You ain't been living right the last 10 years. I don't care how long you, you got your license. You got your license when you was 15. You've been fornicating ever since you were 17 to 35, and now you're 36. So you want to go back to when you was 15, when you got your license, when you ain't been living right since you've been 17, and now, you, and now you're 36, and you ain't been living right from 17 to 35. Come on. You trying to hold on to where you, you, you trying to hold on to where you and God was. You have no idea where God is. Got to be humble. Before you take a car, a watch, clothes, before you take an engagement, you don't need to have an engagement to preach all over the world when you're not humble. They ruined you. A real father would say you're not ready for that promotion. I didn't say you didn't know. I didn't say you, could, you couldn't preach. Sure, you could preach, but you're not ready. Preaching is not your problem. The problem is, is that when you go to that, when you go to that place to preach, and when the women go to hollering, you're going to come home and, you, and, and you're not going to come home the same. Your wife sent you out to do revival and when you came back, you was no longer her husband. Because you weren't humble enough to handle that level of applause. You can't handle those gifts. We ruin children. When you give children everything that the world says is wonderful, you have ruined your children. I know you want to give your children better than what you had, but you ruined your child because your child been having Nike since he's been two years old. 
So now when your children don't get Nike, he's going to steal to get a Nike. He's going to rob to get a Nike. He's going to sell drugs to wear Nikes. Because you spoiled him. Because you never built his character to know that he is the value, not the tennis shoe. So he cannot be without Nike because without Nike, he don't know who he is. Because you identified by what you put on him and you didn't identify him by what, by what you put in him. It's what you put in a child that identifies him, not what you put on him. And we put too many titles on people and we not identify what's in you. It's humility in you before you wear the robe. Before you got somebody carrying your briefcase. I've never met so many people that need to carry another man's briefcase. Who carried it in his car before he got to church? And now it's so bad, the armor bears is meeting the pastors at their house. You can't carry your briefcase from your living room to your car? This is not the spirit. But we want to say we are the apostle, we are the prophet. You too arrogant. You're not walking worthy of it. You just got saved last week and you got business cards. They got you going out and buying gators. You got to wear a pair of gators because you are a preacher now. Why don't you wear humility? Put them on. See? Put on meekness. Put that on. See? Real talk. And we need more men in God, fathers in the ministry. Who need to change because we, we and we got to take the guilt and, and, and take it in the sense of this. The responsibility, I, I am sorry, I apologize for ministers, including myself in my earlier years, who did not protect the real culture. The humility is the culture of the church. When we see the church, we should see humility. When we see preachers now, we're looking at glorified pimps. You know, but a pimp with a robe on. A pimp with a collar. We have did an injustice to it. It's not supposed to be known by uh, 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 preachers of L.A. That's not what preachers of L.A. should stand for. We should not, we not, we not, we're not supposed to be on MTV Cribs. No humility, but you got a 12-bedroom house. The devil is a liar. It don't mean you have to be broke, but you need to be broken. Unless the broken, broke, broken in heart, contrite spirit, God will not deny. We have, we have enough people that are broken. You too rich. That's the problem in the wrong areas. So welcome to the teaching of the prophetic. Because we're going to deal with it. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your anointing. Thank you for glory. Thank you for truth. It's in your word. Ephesians chapter 4. We are prisoners of you. I I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, that you walk worthy of your vocation in which you're called with all loneliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. God, we thank you for this word today. And then we realize that we need to be humble. So we humble ourselves. Take every form of arrogant, self-centered, pride, egotistical ways out of us so that we can be worthy of the vocation. Let us be known for how we serve and not how well we are kings. Yes, Lord. Let us be known for more of how we give and not how we take. Let us be known for how much we suffer and not how much we, ta we attack. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By your name and by your nature, all things are done. Amen. God bless you. Please join us tomorrow, same time, same place. We'll pick up from these points that God gave me, I uh, will deal with insecurity tomorrow. And a lot of times when you're insecure, you can't be humble because your insecurity allows you to grab things that, that, that humility fights against. So we'll talk about that, the struggle of humility and, and what it is, why you can't be become uh, humble. We'll struggle. We'll, we'll talk about that, okay? So love you. God bless you. Walk in God's favor. We thank everybody. If you didn't hit the share button, please share this on your page and get the word out. We, 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 are, re, we, we are rediscovering or the recovery of the prophetic, the recovery of the apostle. I'm going to probably be teaching on the whole five-fold ministry for the rest of the year. So I'm probably going to take a month out on each one of those giftings so we can get it back. But not the, not the normal stuff we've been hearing in church. But really get back to becoming to the, to the image of Christ. That's what it's all about. If you're not looking like God, then take your title off. 
If you're not acting like God, if you're not responding to people's situations with all lowliness and meekness like God, they, they take the title off. It's not going to hurt you to take the title off because you're already messing up the title by where you are. All right? Love you. God bless you. See you tomorrow. Walk in God's favor. 12 noon, we end the fast. Love you. God bless you.